<laughs> anyway, no, they didn't carry a gun. Uh, I don't even know where I was going with that except, uh, oh yeah, yeah, okay, but so the, the collector was out and I knew something, I knew they had been busted, something had happened. Mm -hmm. I knew they'd be there for me the next morning. I sneaked up, look, there was two plain clothesmen and a celebrity. And it's so funny, I had the craziest urge to walk up and verify that they were the police, even though I knew they were. I damn sneaked up to avoid them. And, and I knew they were, and I just had the craziest urge to do so. But I didn't. I sneaked back off and went over to my lawyer's house and stayed. And so uh, later, uh, several days later, they, within a day or two, they served a search warrant on that apartment and turned it upside down. They left the search warrant tacked to the uh, inside there. But an arrest warrant was never issued because what they were going to do, of course, is search, have probable cause, then arrest. Mm -hmm. But they searched, they didn't have probable cause, no warrant was ever issued. But I was out of that apartment then. I couldn't go back, obviously. So I, I went homeless. You went homeless? In, in 1990. I started living in storage. In storage? In, in storage, storage bills? Off, yeah. And I lived in storage, lived in storage for eight and a half years. Eight and a half? Same storage place, or? Yep, yep. And I would stay about uh, about 75 days a year in a Motel 6, free local phone, 7,500 days a year. Mm -hmm. Free local phone, and Motel 6s then uh, were uh, 17, 18, 19, $20 a day. Do you remember what storage facility you yeah, stayed yeah, in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, eight and a half years, I'm sure you remember. Oh, yeah. It was. It went through several incarnations. It was Hack and Stack. Now it's a sure guard storage in um, Jimmy Carter. On uh, Jimmy Carter in... Uh, on that? Yeah, Norcross. Right on the uh, county line, I guess. Yeah, a couple of times I had to leave for a while, lay low and be truly homeless, and then I'd get back in. What's, when I stayed what's the address on that? Do you I know? Just down on Jimmy Carter? Yeah. Oh, county line. Jimmy Carter and Singleton Road. Singleton Road, right on the corner. Uh, east. East. So. East side. Okay. And that was probably all the way up through, you say, 98? Yeah. Is that when you got on with John? Or oh, moved in at John's. I've moved been, in. I've been working with John since uh, 97. 97. Mm -hmm. okay. John, John lived there. Right. Before he got married. Right. And uh, he got married in late 97. Uh, late 97. Right. And he wouldn't let me go, go in for a while, but he did. He, he needed me too bad. I left him uh, in early 97 and stayed gone several months, and he needed me real bad, so he let me move in. By the way, you can tell John Taylor that I'm the one that killed the girl, okay? I'm the one that killed her, but the reason she's dead, I want you to tell Taylor this. The okay. reason she's dead, now I killed her, okay? Right. But the reason she's dead is that when I called him on Wednesday, I guess, or Thursday, yeah, when th well, Thursday, mm -hmm. or whenever. Thursday. When I called him, that girl was alive. Mm -hmm. She was in my van. Yeah. She was in the parking lot, that whole house. And it's just like when I, I told, I gave the girl's body up when I realized that I had been caught there in Square. Right. That's what I told you, because they had me under kidnapping, and it, they, it was gonna stick, the evidence was good right out of the dumpster, it was just a smoking gun, they had me. And on a kidnapping charge, it's the same as a life sentence for me. It's either 30 years for first degree or life for, with bodily harm. So I was getting a life sentence and they had that. And so there was no real use in keeping the girl's body except not to be charged with murder and everything. And I did it under those things because they had me and I did it for the girl's family. Right. Okay. The point I'm trying to make is I gave the girl's body up because you had me. Right. You had me there in square and I was getting life. But you were stopping you were talking about yeah, Tabor. Okay, but Tabor. Mm -hmm. So the same thing applied at that time. The girl was alive. Mm -hmm. And if Tabor hadn't have been such a little smart ass, he's such a girl. These yuppies are all we got a little nation of tattletales here. These guys are such he is a he is a, a bisexual. Yeah, yeah. Really? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He he works the uh, tri the big uh that huge uh, transport city uh, parking lot truck stop in Douglas County, these are cities within themselves, you know. Five hundred trucks, they got some it's a small metropolis of truckers. They got stores all for truck yeah. He goes and works that. He works restrooms. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I you know, I'm hip to that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, he is. But at any rate, 
If Tabor, instead of trying to trap me, I called Tabor up and I asked him, I told him I needed money and I wanted to start working again for him. And I was really sincere in trying to start work again for him because I saw that this uh, robber shit wasn't getting it because I hadn't I gotten any money off her. <laughs> you know, I had gotten a dime. I had spent money on her. I had $45 to my name and I had spent $30 of it driving all over North Georgia trying to work her ATM card on the bogus number she gave me. I had lost money on that deal, you know. And uh, so Tabor has to be coy and, you know, uh, carried all the way, asked for 800, well, I don't know if I can give you that, I stand, I said, well, give me blah, blah, blah. well, okay, I'll leave you a check, yeah, he's such a damn girl, just a smart ass, yeah, but if Tabor, trust me, tell Tabor this, if he hadn't been so, trying to entrap me, he wanted, you know, come and get it at the office, he was just setting a trap for me, he's the one that called him to begin with, he had, all, he had, he had already seen that on TV and, and called him and said it was me, he's the one that, the first one that turned me in, apparently, although, I don't worry about that because if it wasn't Tabor, it would have been someone else within a couple of days. There's too many law enforcement officers in North Georgia, Forest Service officers that know I carry a bat, an expanding bat, that are very familiar with me, including the people out of, uh, out of um, Union County there, and uh, you know, on all, all the WMAs. I, I had plenty of encounters. Anyway, if Tabor had have said, instead of trying to entrap me, I mean, what's the use of that? I mean, really, because if they knew who I am, they're going to catch me anyway. It's just a, if Tabor had said, "Hey, uh, Gary, they know it's you. Yeah, they know it's you. They're on to you. They're looking for you now." Because I wasn't in the paper that day. I, I joked about it with a girl. This this was the second day or third day I I had her. Second or third day I had her, and she still wasn't in the paper. I said, "You know something? No one's even missed you." And she said, boy, I'd be mad if I, if once you let me go, and I came back, and my boyfriend said, have you been gone? <laughs> she said, I really, we were laughing about it, because nothing had appeared in the paper. It was like she hadn't even, I said, they haven't even reported you missing. Yeah, it was like the second or third day, uh, or the third day after she went missing, something like that, the day before she was killed, okay? Mm -hmm. The day before she was killed. Tabor had already turned me in, but it hadn't hit the papers yet. Okay, it hit the papers on Friday. Mm -hmm. I got that, and it, well, I was on the front page. Well, I saw that article like two hours after I killed her. Right. If I had bought a paper that morning on Friday instead of that afternoon, she would have been alive. Because there they, my picture's on the front page, a color picture on the front page of the AJC, looking for me and everything. I wouldn't have killed her, I mean, for Pete's sake, no. And the, the same holds true with Tabor. If Tabor had just said, instead of trying to be a smart ass and lay a trap for me, say he's got to carry it all. These people are such women. That's what women are always doing. The dogs are running loose. I spray their dog. What do they do? They call the police. Okay. The police come and say, he's got a right to defend himself. Your dog. You know, any time a, any time a, a woman or a person says to a, a police officer, start a story with, well, my dog was running loose. Well, they're already wrong. Right there, they they're in violation right there. You know what I'm talking about? That they're wrong for and the police officer. Anyway, if Tabor had just said, "Hey, Gary, that hiker," because she wasn't in the paper. I bought a paper there. I thought I just bought a paper in the gas station before I went there and looked in the paper. They didn't have a payphone at the gas station. I bought the paper at, so I went across to the huddle house to use the phone. I was within looking distance of where I bought the paper. I'd already looked in the paper. I showed her the paper. I said, they haven't even reported you missing yet. You're not even in the paper, right? If Tabor had just said, Gary, they, they know it's you. They're looking for you. The girl would be alive. Girl, listen, the reason for killing the girl, it was either once you've taken someone, you're either going to kill them or you're going to get caught. It's as simple as that. In my situation, look at me. I got the dog. I got the van. I'm me. I'm famous anyway, regardless. And I knew it. Once you've taken someone, you either kill them or you get caught. If you release them, you're going to get caught. I mean, am I right or not? If I would have been sure. Smith, right? Well, she's seen the van. She's seen the tag. She's seen the dog. She's seen all she has to do. They have to put that out. And 10,000 people would be calling, including Tabor. He was just the first one, you know. Of course I knew it. You either kill him or you get caught, okay? But if you're already caught, 
There's no use in killing him. I didn't kill him because for any satisfaction. It was distasteful. It was dreadful. Trust me, it was. Of course, I was able to do it because of my general rage against society. Of course, of course. It's because I'd become... Well, you get that way in Atlanta. Let me, let me, <laughs> let me, I think we talked a little bit about that. You know, you get that way. It's and traffic. And people. So the people are just, now, the, the new aristocracy, they act like they're fucking royalty. You know, they're idiots. And, uh, I guess Tabor's kind of part of that then, somewhat. Uh, Tabor's, uh, uh, kind of part of that, kind of part of that, uh, but, uh, Tabor's a little more, uh, I was saying that when it comes to individual human beings, the answer is really simple. I, I, I simplify groups of human beings, and you really have to actually to preserve your scalp, for that matter. You have to, you have to, you, you have to make broad judgments about groups of human beings, but always understanding that individual human beings, the answer is really simple. It rarely is, and so Tabor has a, a lot of different sides to him. He's got that secret life of a bisexual that he apparently hides from his wife, even though I'm sure she's found out after 10 years of marriage. I'm sure she knows it. They just have an accommodation. So any, any, 95% of homosexuals are lived the life of a heterosexual. And the reason I know this is I spent 17 years in public parks with dogs, spending buku time in public parks with dogs. Fantastic. People say I hung around Murphy Candler. I didn't hang around Murphy Candler. I was doing laps around the damn lake. You know, okay, I'd be there two or three hours. I wasn't hanging around. I was walking my damn dog, okay? I was exercising, you see. And uh, but and in these parks, there are many parks and, and national forest areas and national rec areas that are homosexual cruising grounds. And as a result, you get a first-hand view of exactly what a homosexual is. And I'm going to tell you who they are. They're... Your spouse, your you know, they're your husband, they're your father, they're your supervisor, your manager, your uncle, your dad. That's who they are. They're not, you know, flaming faggots, man. They're guys that look just like men and and you know, and everything. Sometimes the more manly they look, the more they're fag. And that's who fags are. And these guys, what they have to do, Sam Rail's another one, you may uh, he's an attorney. Uh, these guys live a, a lie. They live a lie, whether they're married or single. These guys inflict untold harm on, on women because, like Sam Rail was an attorney, uh, young attorney, unmarried, so he was a mark for every kind of social climbing buckhead bitch in the world. He pulled a lot of good pussy, including girls that went with him for a long time. And he ruined their lives by passing for straight. They were going for a faggot and didn't know it. You know, I used to say, I have a, I have a joke to myself about Janet Tabor. Janet Tabor's an attorney. His wife is an attorney. She graduated number one in a law school, too, which is an accomplishment. Now, I used to have a joke. I, I'd say, Janet Tabor was uh, smart enough to graduate number one in her class in law school, but dumb enough to marry a faggot. And, and, and the reason she did is, is because she went, she dressed him up in her love. Tabor's an immensely attracting guy, totally well-mannered. He has the, the manners of, of a rich person, although he's near, near rich. He went to Druid Hills High School, which is a, a very, it's a public school, but it's, you know, and he's, he's in the country club culture, and he, in fact, et cetera, et cetera. So she went for that. She saw the window dressing. Uh, he has a, a many great personal qualities uh, about him. Uh, he has, he's just a lousy faggot that lies about everything. You can't trust him about everything. I don't know where all this is leading, but... Uh, it, you, you, you and Tabor were pretty tight, though. It's no, the, no. the way I get it. No, I was tight with Tabor. Tabor was not tight with me, nor is he tight with anyone. Oh, okay. Listen, if, if Tabor would screw me, the, the guy who's... You know, I talked to him a lot, and it was me talking to him, and if Tabor would screw me, He'd screw his mother, he'd screw his wife, he'd, he'd screw anybody. Okay? Right. He's a psychopath. I, I'm sure Tabor's laughing now because I, I call Tabor a psychopathic criminal with no heart, no conscience, and no moral compass. And I'm sure he's saying, yeah, look, he's talking. Tabor's worse than me. He's just not dangerous like me. He's, he's just, you're a, a girl. <laughs> he, yeah, he's a girl. I'm a stud, okay? So I do the crime that studs would do. Yeah, he did the crime that, that girls would do, which is lying and stealing. 
Yeah. Did he confess this, this bisexuality to you or anything? Oh, I've been around enough, man. That older woman I told you back when I left my wife, she was what, back in 1971. She was what they call a fag hag. She was a New York Jew. She was what they call a fag hag. A fag hag is a woman that just runs with homosexuals, you know. And it works out good for them because they, everywhere they go, they're surrounded by these gorgeous, good-looking guys who don't look like queers. And, you know, and at the same time, she relates to them as a woman, not as a man. So they can, they can, they can, they can be girls with her, their girl side. You know what I mean? They, you know, they, 